Good evening. How are you? <laughs> I would like to welcome you to the Krasno event series and to our Ambassadors Forum. I'm very pleased to see so many of you. I'm actually quite impressed. Thank you for coming. Our special and distinguished speaker tonight is the Ambassador of India to the United States, Ambassador Shringla. A very, well, a very warm welcome to the Ambassador and to his team, of course. I'm Klaus Laris, and <laughs> thank you, Ambassador, for making your way to Chapel Hill. It's much appreciated. I'm Klaus Laris, and I'm the Richard M. Kresner Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I've been running the Krasno event series and our Ambassadors Forum since uh, 2012, and we have had more than 100 distinguished speakers over the years so far, and I hope there will be plenty of more speakers in the years to come. The Krasno event uh, series, for those of you who haven't uh, been here before, the Krasno event series is a lecture series with prominent diplomats, with military, with politicians, with journalists, economists, and many other interesting people who come to Chapel Hill to tell us about the world, essentially, and tell us about the foreign policy and the economic policies of their countries and areas. In our world of, ter of global turmoil and ri rising nationalism, the Krasno event series wishes to enlighten us about the workings and the functioning and the values of the rules-based global order, about the importance of allies and of having good trade relations and constructive comp uh, comparative uh, uh, and cooperative dealings with the rest of the world. We have a website, krasnoevents.com, we have a mailing list, and you may wish to sign up to that mailing list. And we have our YouTube channel. We videotape all of our events, and then we put them onto our YouTube channel. And actually, the, uh, it's very uh, gr great fun. It's very interesting to watch these videos. And therefore, uh, you should actually watch them repeatedly, because you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't get enough of them. The address of our YouTube channel is uh, youtube.com slash UNC, and you are welcome to subscribe to the channel as well. Tonight, Ambassador Schwingler will talk to us about the important strategic relationship between India and the United States. Then he and I will have a brief discussion on a stage, and I will try to interrogate the ambassador a little about his views of the world. Um, then we will open it up to questions from you, the audience, and afterwards we actually have an interesting and enlightening uh, reception outside this very nice auditorium where we can all mingle a little and discuss things a little bit further. I'm afraid, however, there will be no alcohol. But first, um, I would like to present you with yet another distinguished and special guest tonight. And this... Um, is our special guest, North Carolina Secretary of State, Elaine Marshall. Secretary of State Marshall does not need an introduction here. Elaine has been in office since 1997, and she has really worked tremendously hard for the state of North Carolina. She has received, no wonder, she has received many awards in uh, her long years of service, and it is great to have Elaine Marshall here. Um, Secretary of State Marshall will now introduce Ambassador Schwingler, but before she does so, please uh, join me, ladies and gentlemen, in welcoming both Elaine Marshall, the Secretary of State, and Ambassador Schwingler to UNC Chapel Hill. Mr. Ambassador, faculty, university leadership, students, and friends of India, good evening. It's an honor to be with you tonight. Thank you to Dr. Kraus Lars for his work on this important series of discussions and lectures. Open dialogues that impact us here and globally are critical to our communities and to our success. We should never turn down the chance to improve the exchange of our cultures, of our stories, and our way of life with thousands of foreign visitors who travel here each year. You see, no matter how you define foreign policy, 
It is something entirely too big to be left to a handful of government officials at the national level. We all need to do this because we are all citizens in the most international and globally integrated age that has ever existed. Global studies standing alone or wrapped into other disciplines are vital to our business lives and our personal lives. When we all work to improve our communication, education, and interaction, we all contribute positively to our state and the global economy. I had the great opportunity to visit India earlier this year as a part of a delegation from North Carolina that represented our state at the Bengal Business Summit. Our economic partnership with India has been gaining steam and having tremendous impact. Over the last five years, Indian companies have announced more than $209 million in capital investment and 3,700 new jobs in North Carolina. North Carolina ranks number one in all 50 U.S. states for the total number of announced jobs connected to Indian foreign direct investment. We share a deep, rich history in many traditional sectors, including textiles, but also in newer high tech. My hope and commitment is to con continue the tremendous economic, education, cultural partnership we have with India. Now it's my distinct honor to introduce our featured guest tonight, His Excellency Ambassador Harsh Vadram Sringla. I am under strict instructions to be brief, and I shall. The ambassador is a career diplomat serving in the Indian Foreign Service since 1984. Ambassador Sringla assumed charge affairs as ambassador to the United States in January of this year. In the course of his diplomatic career spanning 35 years, he has served as High Commissioner of India to Bangladesh and Ambassador of India to Thailand. He has served around the globe in France, Vietnam, the United States, Israel, and South Africa. He speaks four languages in addition to Indian dialects. Ambassador Sringala also served in the Ministry of External Affairs in various capacities. He has pursued courses and published papers on conflict prevention, economic diplomacy, the Indian diaspora, and Indian-Bangladesh relations, all quite timely topics. He brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to his role as ambassador to the United States. It is my distinct privilege to say welcome on behalf of the governor and the citizens of North Carolina, Ambassador Harsh Varana Shringala to North Carolina and the stage this evening. Welcome. Namaste and good evening. Let me begin by saying how happy I am to be in this beautiful state of North Carolina. The last time I visited the state, and I was mentioning that to Secretary Marshall, was 15 years ago when I drove through this uh, the Blue Ridge Mountain uh, Highway, went down to this uh, city of Winston-Salem, and uh, unfortunately couldn't stay long because I was moving further south uh, into Tennessee and Mississippi. But I thought to myself, I said, if there's a place that I would like to visit again, it's North Carolina. And I'd like to thank uh, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, for giving me this opportunity to speak at the Krasno Events uh, lecture series uh, and, uh, and also the opportunity to come back to this uh, wonderful state. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity, of course, to wish uh, the university, which I believe is going to celebrate its 226th anniversary in a couple of days, it's the largest, it's the oldest public university in the United States, and it has a lot to do with India. I'm told that you had 281 Indian students in the fall semester in 2018. You've got uh, eight active agreements with uh, reputed institutions in India, uh, with the in Indian School of Business in Hyderabad, with the Jamia Millia University in Delhi, with the Indian Institutes of Management in Bangalore and Ahmedabad, and all of these are obviously uh, agreements that bring a lot of value to both uh, your university and the universities uh, in India. Um, let me uh, thank, of course, uh, Secretary uh, of State, uh, Elaine Marshall, uh, for very kind introduction and for welcoming me to your state. Uh, I look forward to meeting uh, Governor tomorrow and other members of the administration. I'd like to thank, also acknowledge and thank Professor Robert Bluin, the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, uh, Professor 
Ambassador Barbara Stephenson, Vice Provost for Global Affairs, Professor Rudy Correredo Mansfield, Senior Associate Dean for Social Sciences and Global Programs, Professor Klaus Laris, uh, Richard M. Krasno, Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs, Director of Krasno Global Affairs and Business Council, students and faculty members of uh, UNC Chapel Hill, uh, our good friend uh, Dr. S Dr. Sudesh Chaudhary, uh, Chatterjee, uh, and uh, of course the uh, members of the Indian American community in the area um, and other friends who are here. Um, when we uh, talk about the relationship uh, between India and the United States, and that's the topic of the, uh, of the lecture today, it's uh, India and the United States, a strategic partnership. Um, it really uh, makes you uh, think about uh, what the relationship uh, is in contemporary terms, what it has been in the past and what could, it could be in the future. But when I arrived here in uh, January uh, this year, uh, it did strike me that the relationship uh, had come very fast and very far. In other words, uh, we had reached the stage that we are in today, which is a strategic partnership with the major defense partner of the United States. We have an extensive cooperation which cuts across all sectors, political, security and defense, trade and investments, people-to-people -people contacts. Very few countries enjoy the, the breadth and depth of a relationship that India and the United States does. But at the same time, you have to keep in mind that this relationship that we see today is only 15 years old in, in its making. Uh, its its, its uh, development uh, in the current manifestation has been relatively recent. And the question really is, uh, why did it take so long for two countries that had that enjoyed similar values, similar ideologies, uh, believed uh, in the same uh, rules-based global order that Professor Krasno referred to, um, uh, to come together? Why did it take so many decades of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, cooperation since 1947, since India became an independent country? And I think uh, the answer really is, uh, goes back, if you go back to history, uh, you started with, uh, with a relationship that was based exactly on those uh, sentiments uh, that we enjoyed that India in 1947 emerged as a democratic, secular democratic republic, a country that believed in the same freedoms as the United States, but at the same time uh, sort of could, uh, could sort of appreciate uh, or rather maintain a relationship that, that uh, was equidistant with countries all over the world. But the initial bonhomie was reflected in the good friendship between uh, Prime Minister Jawala Nehru and uh, President Kennedy, and we've seen uh, a very good uh, friendship developed between the two heads of government in those days. I think the turning point came when the Cold War intensified and there was a, 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 some sort of pressure on countries like India to commit themselves to, to one side or the other. And uh, India under Nehru decided to remain as a non-aligned country. We were members of the non-aligned movement and decided to maintain an independent foreign policy. And it was 1965 when the 1965 war happened uh, the U.S. decided to uh, place restrictions on the equipment and the, uh, the uh, spares that it supplied India at that time. And I think that was a turning point in many senses. But I think the actual break came in 1971 when, to the disappointment of many Indians, uh, the U.S. decided to back a dictatorship uh, at that time in Pakistan, which was uh, having its own civil war with a large part of the country, that is East Pakistan, uh, breaking away. Uh, after a very, very protracted and bloody, uh, let's say, a civil war akin almost to genocide, which took the lives of uh, between 300,000 and 3 million people, depending on different accounts that you have. And uh, in that uh, war of uh, conscience, I think uh, the United States took uh, the side of Pakistan, had the Seventh Fleet come into the Bay of Bengal, and then the relationship, of course, uh, wasn't uh, the same until Another opportunity arose when the Cold War ended and uh, India went in for its structural adjustment program, liberalized its economy, went in for uh, measures that were uh, moved uh, move towards the free market economy. Uh, the U.S. also looked at an opportunity where it could reach out to India as a uh, closer friend and partner. And I think the real change again, uh, if you look at it on a positive side of things, occurred in 2008 uh, when President Bush, uh, under the Bush administration, uh, you had the, two, the civil nuclear agreement, which was really a carve-out for India, a special carve-out for India. And I think I'm sure people like uh, 
Dr. Suresh Chatterjee remember that time because he was one of those who actively worked uh, to secure uh, uh, support for that particular piece of legislation in, in the U.S. Congress. Uh, uh, and uh, it was a hard sell because uh, this was really uh, very, uh, I would say, a major change from those who would be uh, purists in some terms of uh, the nuclear regime that existed at that time. And, uh, and ultimately, the fact that this could be uh, achieved was really, I think, the turning point in relations between our two countries. And we haven't looked back since because uh, since that time, we have uh, developed a relationship that has grown uh, as I said, stronger and more uh, uh, more robust in its uh, in its uh, uh, relationship, in its manifestations. Uh, we, of course, uh, if you look at the strategic side of things, you have uh, uh, defense and security uh, aspect of it. Uh, India, as I said, is a major defense partner of the United States. This is something the Congress decided on. It really means that uh, the U.S. and India work closely together on issues that are of strategic importance to both countries. Um, one of the areas that we work, uh, which I think is a focus of both countries, is the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the U.S. decided to name the Pacific Command the Indo-PACOM. Uh, India decided to create a special division in its Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs called the Indo-Pacific Division. Uh, this is an area in which, uh, geographically, it's it was described by the former Secretary Rex Tillerson as, as being from Hollywood to Bollywood. Uh, but we would like to see it extend beyond that into Africa. Uh, we believe that uh, the Indo-Pacific should encompass not just, not just come from the shores of the United States to the shores of India, but also include what we call West Asia and, uh, and uh, the continent of Africa in that ambit. But what is important is that we are working together with the United States, with Japan, uh, with other countries like Australia that, have, uh, that are like-minded, in trying to develop a region that we live in, which believes in the same principles of a free, open, transparent, inclusive Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and this is, uh, in many senses, uh, what we would like to see our region uh, become uh, in the years that, uh, in the future. And uh, we would like to also, I think, uh, ensure that this is the region that believes in a rules-based global order, which believes in, uh, in uh, arbitration, uh, international arbitration, which believes in uh, freedom of navigation, um, uh, the rights to passage, uh, essentially uh, transparent systems of, of uh, uh, ensuring and, uh, and facilitating connectivity, which is very important for many countries in the region, in the Indo-Pacific. And uh, our aim, of course, is to work with other countries uh, and get other countries uh, to look at how they could be part of this process to ensure uh, a more uh, transparent system that all of us believe in. And this is, I think, uh, the most important perspective, from, from our perspective, the more, most important aspect of the Indo-Pacific uh, concept that is being developed. Um, we do believe, as, as a country, that we are, in many senses, uh, a first responder and a net security provider in our own region. Uh, when, you have, uh, when you had uh, a huge cyclone that hit uh, Mozambique, uh, Indian ships were the first to reach and provide uh, relief. When you had uh, uh, a sort of a water shortage in, in, in Mali, uh, our ships were the first to reach there and provide uh, drinking water in Maldives. You had a cyclone in uh, Sri Lanka, uh, our ships were the first there. Uh, I was in Bangladesh when you had a huge influx of Rohingya refugees. About 400,000 came in in a matter of months. Uh, the administration couldn't cope with that load. Uh, but we had uh, our aircraft come in, and uh, they were uh, happily C-17 Globemaster aircraft that we had recently acquired from the United States. It gave us the heavy lift capacity to come in quickly, provide relief supplies in a matter of, in a matter of hours, and, uh, and of course, uh, uh, provide that relief until uh, ships could come in and bring more uh, material that was required for humanitarian relief. But HADR is the way to go, and today we have uh, some of our largest military exercises with the U.S. Uh, this year we are going to have uh, the tri-services exercise involving the Army, Navy, and Air Force, but it's going to be focused on humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, which is an area which is uh, important because most of our countries in the Indo-Pacific uh, suffer from national calamities, and uh, cooperation in that area is a hand of friendship which is very important in terms of the uh, our neighbors and the friends that we deal with uh, in our neighborhood. Uh, we have, of course, uh, uh, gradually also shifted our uh, 
let us say, um, sourcing of equipment uh, and defense equipment and technology from the United States. In the last uh, 10 years, we purchased $18 billion worth of U.S. Uh, defense equipment. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, that has given us, uh, in many senses, a qualitative uh, uh, advantage. And certainly, um, one aspect of that is also working together with the U.S. to develop uh, new uh, equipment systems uh, under what we call the DTI, uh, Defense Technologies Initiative. And that is also something which is uh, coming up uh, very, very interestingly. Uh, Counterterrorism is an important area for cooperation in the security realm. We work with the U.S. in what is called a designations dialogue. Uh, we, uh, we have a good idea about uh, uh, those who are terrorist elements in our neighborhood. The U.S. has uh, its own ideas. We get together and we see which of these entities can be listed, which of these individuals can be listed. And recent listings of individuals have been uh, quite, uh, uh, I would say, prominently uh, um, publicized uh, in the media. And, and of course, uh, we work on counterterrorism capacity building and a lot of areas that, that uh, work for both our countries. Uh, trade and investments is a very important part of our relationship. Uh, the United States is our largest trading partner. Our trade last year was about $142 billion. Uh, by all accounts, this year it could, uh, in, it could su uh, surpass $160 billion. Um, if we are bucking the global trend of, of a slow rate of growth in, in the trade sector, uh, our trade is increasing by over 10% every year, year and year. And uh, we're very happy that uh, in that endeavor, India is uh, making a conscious effort to buy more American goods, uh, to reduce the adverse trade balance uh, that exists between our two countries. Uh, last year, we bought $4.5 billion of oil and gas from the United States. We placed orders for 300 civilian aircraft worth $39 billion. And this year, we intend to buy $8 billion of oil and gas uh, from the U.S. So it is a relationship that is developing. There is a synergy there. The U.S. is the largest producer of both oil and gas today. Uh, in, the, in the next decade or two, India will be able to account for 25% of global increases in energy consumption. And while we are working uh, towards reaching our goal, of meeting 40% of our energy requirements through new and renewable sources of energy. We will continue to diversify our sources of energy as we see it. Uh, we are dependent on uh, imports of energy for about uh, 70 to 80% of our energy needs. So there is a huge uh, importance ascribed to uh, the manner in which we diversify our sources of energy and get the best uh, options available to us in terms of uh, energy procurement. Um, of course, when we talk about investments, uh, uh, this is uh, an interesting area because investments, like trade, is a two-way, um, let's say, exchange. Uh, there are 2,000 U.S. companies that are based in India, um, whether, they are, um, uh, whether they are manufacturing in India, whether they have joint ventures, whether they are into technology, they have offices in India. Uh, many of them are undertaking their research and development in India. But there are also, and this is about $50 billion of investments from the United States, but we also have about $20 billion of investments from Indian companies in the United States. I was very happy yesterday to visit one of them called Sundaram Clayton, which is a company which is uh, based in uh, the city of Chennai in, in the state of Tamil Nadu. Uh, Sundaram Clayton manufactures uh, aluminum uh, mold dyes, which is, uh, which is required for the automobile industry, and uh, has uh, really... Uh, made its presence a very, very useful one, providing value to the communities that it uh, is uh, situated in. And I'm very happy to see that uh, and hear from Secretary Marshall that uh, uh, Indian investments have been quite prominent in North Carolina. I was also very happy to, uh, to see that the, the governor recently announced a new Indian investment uh, from Bharat Forge for $160 million, uh, again, to manufacture aluminum uh, molds. Um, and I think that would also be an important uh, uh, investment, providing about 300 uh, jobs in, in, in the state. But uh, if you go back to Sundaram Clayton, what impressed me was the fact that uh, they are using aluminium, they used to source aluminium from China. Uh, but because you have raised tariffs on Chinese uh, imports of aluminium, uh, U.S. aluminium uh, production has become competitive. So today they use only U.S. aluminium for their raw material. Uh, they use the aluminium to make it into sophisticated parts for the automobile industry. 
which they are using to supply OEMs not only in the United States but all over the world. So you are creating value in uh, the states uh, in, this, in, in, in your areas. And I think uh, this is what uh, is, uh, in, in, in terms of synergies, the best sort of mutually beneficial relationship that you could have. Uh, Indian companies create value in the United States and U U.S. companies create in value in India. Um, and in fact, uh, Prime Minister Modi, when he visited uh, the U.S., uh, this must have been uh, two years ago, uh, he did mention that the U.S. has become is the preferred partner of choice uh, for the socio-economic transformation of India through flagship schemes and programs. In other words, we have a very ambitious program of developing the country, very ambitious program of ensuring the betterment of our people, uh, increasing our GDP to reach $5 trillion. And uh, clearly the U.S. is a source of investments, uh, trade, but also technology. Uh, the U.S. is one of the most important partners when it comes to technology. We're looking at uh, cutting-edge technologies, which is in artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, big data mining, um, in areas that, uh, that uh, could enable us to leapfrog uh, various stages of our development. And uh, we've seen a lot of interest uh, in uh, U.S. companies uh, in this regard. Uh, venture capitalists have also been very active in promoting um, joint ventures between startups in India and those in the United States. And this is an area that's seen significant growth in the recent, uh, recent past. Uh, and of course, uh, when you talk about technology, you can't uh, avoid what is an important area, a very, very visible area of cooperation, which is in the space sector. I don't know how many of uh, us would know that in the last Chandrayaan-2 mission, which was uh, uh, to land our Vikram, uh, Vikram lander, which was supposed to land on the south side of the moon, which, is, which has never been visited before, uh, was carrying uh, some instruments from NASA, but also communication system that the lander had uh, enabled it to communicate, that's the the Chandrayaan rocket uh, communications were provided was a collaboration with NASA. So we work closely with NASA in the space sector, and uh, it's an area where I think we, uh, we have a great deal of uh, pride in, in the sort of achievements that we have jointly uh, brought about. Um, now, uh, I don't know how much time we have, but let me come to one aspect which is very important, which is the people-to-people -people connect between our countries. Um, the, uh, I, I did mention uh, Dr. Suresh Chatterjee. I don't know if he's here in the, in the audience, uh, but uh, he is an important link. But like him, we have uh, around 4 million uh, American Indians, uh, uh, people of Indian origin who are U.S. nationals today, but an important, what our Prime Minister calls a living bridge between our two countries. And they are the ones who provide uh, the linkage, whether it's trade, investments, uh, technology, uh, and of course, uh, for uh, many of the people uh, in India, particularly the younger generations, which is the majority of our population, uh, they are a role model of a successful community that has uh, done well for themselves uh, as immigrants, worked hard and achieved and provided, brought value to the societies and communities that they live in in the United States. Uh, so that that people to people connect is, is the community, but you also have uh, students. Um, um, I can see that uh, Rupal Shah, our education advisor, is here. And we have 200,000 Indian students uh, who study in the United States. <coughs> Cumulatively contribute $7.5 billion to the U.S. economy. And very happy that many of them study in the state of North Carolina, including, as I mentioned, in uh, the University of uh, North Carolina, Chapel Hill itself. And uh, there is also a very important link because uh, many of our finest minds in India are here. Uh, looking for, for uh, higher avenues of knowledge and, and, and research. And I think uh, as they uh, uh, study here and as they uh, spend time here, they also contribute in, in their own ways to both the United States and to India. Uh, and tourism. Tourism is also a very important link. Uh, tourism from India to the United States is increasing every year. And I'm told that the uh, number of tourists from India to the U.S. has increased to 1.4 million and they contribute uh, close to $16 billion to the U.S. economy. And of course, uh, the U.S. also provides among the largest number of tourists to India, over a million tourists in the U.S. that visit India every year, a very important link uh, between our two countries. Um, so you can see that the gamut is very wide. What does the future hold for the relationship? Uh, we would like to see this relationship not in short terms, uh, not, not in five years, not in ten years. We'd like to see it 50 years down the line. And I think uh, if we can see it from that perspective, then we can plan better. 
uh, we can shape our priorities uh, uh, more uh, carefully and in a more calibrated manner. Uh, we will have to look beyond uh, our uh, democratic, uh, let's say, uh, schedules, uh, which means that in India you don't plan beyond five years, in the US you don't plan beyond four years. Uh, but if we can look beyond that period, I think we would certainly uh, find uh, a certain uh, level of uh, stability and a certain level of, uh, I would say, uh, prospective planning that can enable us to look at uh, how we can evolve as two countries that in many senses I think will have an important role to play both uh, regionally and globally on issues that uh, encompass uh, uh, not just needs of our own countries but what are global requirements. Uh, in India, uh, we are increasingly looking at how we can contribute uh, in, in areas that are important to all of us. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, global warming uh, and, and climate change are important factors for us. So we are looking at uh, how we can organize countries that are developing countries but have abundant solar energy, how to utilize the potential of that solar energy through the International Solar Alliance that we formed countries between the capes of Tropic and capes of uh, Cancer and Capricorn. Uh, and uh, how we can provide them with the capacity and resources to become uh, self-sufficient in the use of uh, solar energy. Uh, we have recently banned the use of single-use single use plastics. Uh, we banned e-cigarettes. Uh, we are looking at uh, revolutionizing the way sanitation is, 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 uh, is uh, a subject in India. Uh, in the last uh, five years, we have uh, constructed, as collectively as a nation, 50 million uh, toilets that uh, now provide for sanitation for 99% of the rural population. So we are looking at, at, at means and schemes and various initiatives that could in many senses uh, uh, change the way India is today and change in, in that sense also contribute to, the, to a change in, in a global sense. And as Mahatma Gandhi said, and we are celebrating his 150th birth anniversary as we speak, be the change that you want the world to be and that is how we see it. So let me uh, end because I know that you have a timeline and there's going to be also some time for uh, conversation and some exchanges uh, which we, I think are more important. Uh, and so I'd end with uh, a quote from our Prime Minister when he came and addressed the joint sessions of Parliament, uh, joint sessions of Congress uh, in 2016. And he says, today our relationship has overcome the hesitations of history. I spoke about the hesitations in the past and that's a distant past. Comfort, candor, and convergence define our conversations. And I'll end here and take, up, uh, take this up in questions. Thank you. said that in, in, in uh, contemporary terms, the amount of wealth that have been, would have been taken out of India in the 200 years of British rule would amount to $60 trillion. I don't know how accurate that is, but that is certainly a phase in history in which uh, I think uh, uh, it is a dark chapter in our history. Uh, of course, there were some advantages. It gave us uh, you know, a unified uh, administration, gave us uh, many senses, uh, you know, brought the country together after several years of uh, deciding. But, the fact of the matter is that uh, it, it has been uh, debilitating from the point of view of converting India from what has been one of the wealthiest countries uh, in global terms at that time uh, to one of the poorest in 1947. Uh, and uh, we are still uh, in the process of recovering from that uh, phase of history. Uh, but Brexit, of course, is, uh, is something that seems to uh, you know, defy logic in many senses uh, and you sometimes tend to lose uh, uh, you know, the narrative because, uh, you know, there have been so many ups and downs that you're not really sure where we are at this point in time. But I think it's important for, uh, from our point of view that uh, there is a coherent plan in all of this. Uh, both the, we are major uh, trading partners in both uh, Europe and 
the United Kingdom, and uh, we certainly would like to see uh, some, uh, let's say, outcome which is uh, which is uh, enables a smooth uh, post, uh, let's say, Brexit uh, situation and allows uh, countries like uh, ourselves also to continue uh, our. Uh, economic engagement uh, with the region in a satisfactory manner. Thank you very much. Let's hope global Britain will become true. Uh, <laughs> since you left Washington, um, dangerous developments in the Middle East have taken place. Some American troops have been withdrawn. A lot of Turkish troops have gone into Kurdish-controlled areas. Are you worried about the situation? Is there a role for India to play to mediate, perhaps? Well, uh, we have expressed some level of dismay at uh, Turkey's unilateral actions in, in moving into Syria. Uh, we believe that this could uh, uh, cause uh, some level of disruption uh, and, and uh, I would say could even impact on, on uh, the civilian population in ways that would be uh, of concern all around. Um, obviously, we would like to see uh, minimum uh, collateral damage. In, in other words, I think from our perspective, uh, Turkey's uh, initiative to go into Syria and to take uh, actions uh, against uh, groups that they consider hostile uh, is uh, uh, justified from a certain point of view because it is, uh, as long as it is counterterrorism and as long as those objectives are met, but uh, when it, it goes into uh, you know, uh, taking human lives and casualties uh, at civilian level, then I think it is a matter of concern. And we have issued a statement in which we have expressed uh, concern over this uh, uh, development. Uh, it it uh, provokes an already volatile situation in that part of uh, the region and uh, clearly it is uh, not in the interest of, uh, not in regional or global interest to have uh, the situation. So the Turkish forces should be withdrawn as soon as possible? Well, we believe that is the ideal situation. I think uh, uh, there's always uh, ways to work out situations uh, and uh, you know, uh, clearly, uh, this is something that uh, uh, has the potential to make situations worse. Thank you, thank you. As you know, the rising powers in the world are India and China, and it has been claimed. I'm not saying it's correct, but it has been claimed that India's role is a bit similar to Europe. They are in the middle, torn between China and the United States. Sometimes they side with China, sometimes they are a bit closer to the United States. So they basically don't want to antagonize neither China nor the U.S. Do you think there's some validity to that statement? Well, in general, we don't want to antagonize anyone. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, having said that, uh, I think uh, uh, if you heard what I said, uh, I think the relationship with the United States is a very special one. It is developed in a manner that uh, is based on mutualities of, uh, of uh, you know, values, principles, and the way we think and the way we uh, want to lead uh, our lives. Uh, and I think uh, from that point of view, uh, we've had a convergence with the U.S., which is quite fair. Uh, we also are a neighbor of China. So we enjoy a large uh, border with China. Uh, we have a significant trading relationship with China. We've had civilization linkages with China. And so uh, we have a relationship with China also that is, uh, that is uh, important. And, uh, and you're correct in saying that uh, antagonism is not something that we want to precipitate with, with either country. We want to work uh, constructively with all our friends and, and uh, work uh, on areas that are important to us uh, in, mutu in mutually beneficial terms. Uh, but it is true that uh, we would like to see a global order uh, that conforms to our way of thinking and the way we see things. And I think that uh, is, is an important uh, level of convergence that we enjoy. There's a lot of concern in the U.S., as you know, about China. Some say it's exaggerated, some say its concern is actually underplayed, it's not large enough, we are not aware uh, enough of the uh, uh, problems from China. Does India share this view or has India a very different view about the rise of China? Well, as I said, our relationship with China is a complicated one. Uh, we, uh, Give us some details. <laughs> <laughs> we've had, uh, uh, if you look at it historically, we've had uh, exchanges over time that have been largely, uh, you know, uh, constructive, peaceful. Uh, we have President Xi Jinping who is going to visit uh, India on the 11th of October. Uh, he's going to go down to a southern uh, state of Tamil Nadu, a place called Mahabalipuram, uh, which is famous for, uh, it was the, it was the, 
location of the Pallava dynasty uh, in the south, southern part of India dynasty that uh, had extensive trade and cultural linkages with Southeast Asia and even China. So Mahabalipuram uh, is important from a historic point of view because it's from the shores of Mahabalipuram that ships set out and uh, had a specific intercourse with, with, with China. And I'm told that one of the kings of, uh, of uh, the Pallav dynasty also visited China and introduced uh, martial arts and some culture, uh, you know, some cultural attributes uh, into China. To what extent that's correct, I'm not sure. But the fact is, this is where uh, linkages have been uh, very, very uh, evident. And so, um, uh, you know, we uh, obviously uh, need, feel the need to have uh, a continuous dialogue uh, with China. Um, uh, what is important, I think, to note is that uh, we have a, a certain understanding with China that while our borders are not uh, demarcated, uh, the boundary is uh, one that is disputed by both sides. We will not allow this uh, issue to, to come in the way of a normal relationship. In other words, we will isolate the border, deal with it to a special uh, group that uh, is an empowered group that looks at it. But we will continue our relationship, which is in trade, which is in science and technology, people to people contacts. We will not allow that to come. And this really is very different from uh, what we have tried to do with another neighbor, which is Pakistan. Uh, we have told Pakistan that let's work on a similar model. Let's move ahead in issues that uh, where we could issues like trade, issues like uh, soft borders uh, where people could, uh, you know, go and meet their relatives, come back, uh, work on areas that uh, are beneficial to both countries and then come down to issues that are more difficult to handle. But I think that is not acceptable uh, uh, to that country and we couldn't uh, work in that model as possible. So with China, it's a complicated relationship. We've had a border dispute in 1962, a border skirmish. Uh, we've had, uh, obviously, since then we've come a long way. We try to work out a modus vivendi by which we avoid conflict. Uh, we avoid coming into direct conflict. And, and so while we have this huge swath of water that's disputed, the two armies try and work it, work it out in a manner that uh, prevents them from coming into direct uh, contact. And it has worked, largely worked uh, so far. Mm -hmm. But there have been exceptions and uh, some flashpoints, and uh, we don't want that to uh, become the uh, general uh, model. Thank you. President Trump has offered to mediate in the Kashmir problem. Would you say that is a sensible suggestion or what will happen to resolve to that situation? Well, uh, let me qualify that by saying that uh, President Trump and Prime Minister Modi enjoy a very good relationship. Uh, we've had uh, four meetings between the Prime Minister and the President since uh, the re-election of Prime Minister Modi in May this year. Uh, and the most notable of them was when they jointly addressed a group of over 50,000 Indian Americans in the city of Houston in the Saudi Modi event. And, uh, and of course, uh, I think uh, if you, this is a meeting in, in Biarritz in the margins of the G7 summit when the President and Prime Minister met. Uh, and uh, the Prime Minister uh, said that, look, uh, this is an issue that we can handle uh, by ourselves. And uh, I think the president has internalized that and has said very clearly that uh, uh, while he's happy to offer mediation, it depends on both countries. Clearly, India is not willing to go in for mediation, and so that offer is off the table. So we don't see that as being uh, something that is, uh, uh, is, is an active uh, uh, proposal. Uh, I think as far as we are concerned, uh, this issue has and can be resolved uh, uh, bilaterally uh, uh, between our two countries. Can you give us any idea if solutions are on the way of being implemented? Because when you follow the New York Times and similar papers, they report on difficult situations there. I can only say don't believe everything you read in the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that includes the op-ed I wrote for the New York Times. Uh, <laughs> Of course, you must believe in that. <laughs> but, uh, right, but the but Financial Times wrote something similar. You know, we cannot just discard all no, uh, I think uh, we're, records. We're mixing up what is uh, an internal issue to India and what is the issue of Jammu and Kashmir, which is a which is a disputed issue. I think if you go historically, in 1947, uh, the British there were 400 odd minister, princely states in India, and the British uh, 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 allowed uh, the you know, heads of those princely states to decide to accede either to India or to Pakistan uh, based on a legal instrument called the Instrument of Accession. Uh, so, uh, in the case of Kashmir, uh, the ruler of Jammu and Kashmir decided to deposit the Instrument of Accession in favor of India. He handed over that Instrument of Accession to Lord Mountbatten, who was the Governor General of India at that time. 
Uh, and therefore, in de jure terms, in, in legal terms, the whole of Jammu and Kashmir, including those parts occupied by Pakistan and China, are actually parts of India. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, uh, if there is a dispute, it is only about how those parts come back to India. Now, in terms of the recent developments in Jammu and Kashmir, uh, these have been, uh, 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 let's say, procedure in our parliament, in our legislative procedure, through which we have abrogated an article which is called Article 370, which gave Jammu and Kashmir some special powers, a special status. Now, this uh, special status happened because when uh, Jammu and Kashmir acceded to India in 1947, it was felt that uh, there should be some way to smoothen their integration into the Union of India. But it was always considered to be temporary. In other words, it was included in Schedule 21 of the Constitution, which was temporary. So any laws that were enacted in a national parliament uh, would be then adopted in the, in the Jammu and Kashmir Assembly and then adopted. But in the recent decades, what we found is less and less of the legislation enacted in the Indian parliament were incorporated into Jammu and Kashmir. In other words, proactive legislation, which was in terms of socio-economic justice, those that, were, uh, that believed in gender parity, that believed in right to education, right to employment, right to information, uh, children's uh, rights, uh, LGBT rights, all those were not incorporated into the Jammu and Kashmir uh, assembly. Uh, secondly, of course, uh, the fact is that uh, over a period of time, development uh, assistance or rather the allocation uh, by the federal government to the state of Jammu and Kashmir for development purposes did not reach the grassroots level for which they were intended or the beneficiaries did not get that benefit because the political elite was siphoning off a lot of that. In the last 40 years, in the last 15 years, the government of India has allocated 40 billion dollars of development funds to the state. Very little of it has reached uh, the level that it was supposed to. So, for the sake of good governance, socio-economic justice, and development, we have abrogated what is a temporary provision in the constitution by a two-thirds majority of members of parliament who have voted for it. And keep in mind that the ruling party, the government in, in, of the day, does not have a two-thirds majority which means that the opposition has cross-voted in favor of this legislation. So it is a legal process that has been undergone. And because it's a constitutional change, it is internal to India. It does not impinge on the borders of the boundaries of the state of Jammu and Kashmir or in the line of control. So it has nothing to do with any other country, including Pakistan. It is a purely internal matter for India. Uh, so uh, the overall issue can be discussed. Uh, bilaterally, as we have decided in two agreements, the Simla Agreement of 1971, and the Lahore Declaration of 1999 that Jammu and Kashmir will discuss bilaterally between India and Pakistan, will not be internationalized, not be taken to the UN, not be taken to other countries, will be discussed between India and Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And that uh, these are two different issues. Thank you, but it is true that there is serious concern about the domestic situation in Kashmir, but I think we need to discuss that further um, at a later stage. Let me ask my uh, I'm final... I discuss it now if you want, uh, yeah. because I don't see any serious issue in Jammu and Kashmir. Okay. As a matter of fact, uh, just to clarify on the record, the situation has been moving towards normalcy. Uh, practically all restrictions that were put in place when, the, uh, when Article 370 was abrogated have now been withdrawn. Uh, there is normal traffic, schools are open, hospitals are open, <coughs> offices are open, uh, communications are completely restored except for some cellular connectivity in the valley. Uh, there is no restriction in terms of people contacting others because landlines are all secure. Um, as a matter of fact, even political, uh, you know, there, was, there were some political uh, leaders who were under house arrest. In other words, they were in their homes but they were not uh, allowed to go out. They have been meeting their party members. So there is a political process which is underway and on the 24th of October we will be having what are called block development council elections which are elections which will be across the state where people will come and vote and will, will exercise their franchise and their mandate. So I think uh, the situation is fast going towards normalcy. I am sorry I interrupted because I wanted to set the record straight and keep everybody informed of the latest developments in that regard. Okay, thank you. Let me ask you my final question before we open it up. Um, the world uh, economy, the global economy, is, seems to go into recession. China has contracted, the United States has worries about it, Germany, Europe is contracting, um, India has also contracted economically, I believe. 
And you mentioned the good sta status of American Indian relations. Well, I'm not doubting that things can always be improved. So, what would be your concrete proposals how to improve the American Indian economic relationships, which then also would help the global economy? I take it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and it's, an, it's a very important and pertinent question, uh, Professor Laris, because uh, the US and India are engaged in, in trade negotiations as of now. Uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, reached a fairly uh, uh, developed stage in those negotiations and we're looking at uh, uh, trying to conclude a package that would give greater market access to the United States to the Indian market for agricultural products. Um, in return for it, some of our agricultural products would, would be allowed to access the U.S. market. Uh, we are also looking at the restoration of uh, you know, the generalized system of preferences. As you are aware, GSP will be drawn from India, and India was the largest beneficiary of the GSP, accounting for some $6.7 billion of goods, mainly intermediate goods that fed into U.S. downstream industries. So this, in other words, this uh, trade agreement that we could reach uh, in a matter of uh, weeks or months uh, in the near future, I think augurs well for the relationship. But uh, what is important also is that our two countries are looking at the possibility of starting negotiations on a partial or a complete free trade agreement. In other words, we're looking at how we can work together to, uh, uh, to reach a stage that all of us believe in, that we are all free market economies. Uh, I think the Secretary mentioned that there's a lot of importance on uh, free market economies uh, you know, in, in both uh, in the state of uh, North Carolina and uh, in the U.S. in, in particular. Uh, and, and I think, of course, uh, we are happy to see how we can, uh, uh, we can reach a win-win situation where there is a mutuality of benefit in both sides by reaching an agreement that would allow freer movement of goods between our two countries. Thank you. We all like win-win situations, I think. <laughs> Let's open it up to, the, uh, uh, to questions from the audience. Any questions, please? Yes, please. <laughs> Can you briefly introduce yourself? Uh, my, name is, my name is Sunil Zakkar. I'm a local resident and a parent of a UNC student. Uh, my name is Sunil Zakkar. I'm a local resident and a parent of a UNC student. Uh, my question to the ambassador would be, where is, what is the current status of the civil nuclear deal signed between India and USA about 10 years ago? Well, the civil nuclear deal uh, you know, provided a regime under which uh, India would, uh, would continue with its uh, civilian nu nuclear energy and would receive technology and uh, you know, uh, equipment, etc., from the US and certain other countries. Uh, it helped us also get gain access to other uh, regimes that were important, the NTCR uh, and, and others. Uh, and, and of course, uh, that regime continues even today. Uh, one part of that was that uh, the uh, sense was that uh, U.S. companies would get involved in the civil nuclear energy sector in India. Uh, that did not happen because uh, of a number of developments, including the fact that Westinghouse, which is one of the main companies that was going to be involved in this, was itself, I think, uh, bought over, became a Canadian company, and then uh, decided that they would not pursue turnkey contracts, that they would only do specific contracts. And so it's complicated, but we still hope that Westinghouse will come in and, and, and uh, get involved in the uh, nuclear energy sector. Thank, thank you. Just over there. Um, hello, sir. Uh, my name is Parag. I'm KG student here. I have a question about, you mentioned about the refugee status uh, in, in Bangladesh. But with the refugee bills that are newly coming up in India, especially the Citizenship Amendment Bill, which allows except Muslims, which allows Hindus, Buddhists, and other, other groups which are affected by religious persecution. Uh, and, and this has been also being now propagated, especially in the northeastern part of India, and now we try to other places. Do you see that there is an inherent Islamophobia working out there? What's your opinion about that? Well, you know, it's still a bill. Let's start with that uh, fact first and foremost. It is not an act of parliament. Uh, what the bill seeks to do is that there are a lot of Indians. You see, if you take the case of Pakistan, uh, in 1947, 23% of Pakistan consisted of minorities. Hindus, Buddhists, Christians, uh, others. Uh, today, it's only 3%. Uh, there is a, a very sustained level of persecution which has been uh, you know, backed up by acts like the Blasphemy Acts. And, 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 and so, uh, what this bill aims to do is to provide uh, some level of refuge for those minorities who want to uh, come into India. Uh, and that is the intention, is to provide some level of uh, 
many of the minorities that came into India, including two and a half, uh, 250,000 uh, refugees who came from, from uh, Pakistan in 1947, continue to live uh, in the state of Jammu and Kashmir as stateless citizens because of the Article 370. Uh, you know, they, they, you know, so we are trying to deal with ambiguities of this nature that there are a lot of uh, people who are minorities that are already living in India that don't have any status uh, in India. So it is an attempt to give them some sort of citizenship rights. Uh, it certainly does not uh, uh, discriminate against other citizens, including Muslim uh, citizens of India who are Muslim. Uh, you have to keep in mind that India is the second largest Muslim population in the world. Uh, and this uh, is a population that has enjoyed all the benefits of a secular democracy has voted or rather elected to stay in India despite the fact that Pakistan was created under the two nation theory that you need a separate homeland for Muslims. In 1971 the creation of Pakistan really mitigated against that logic because Bangladesh said that we would not like to be a part of Pakistan. We want to become a secular democratic republic and today the 15 percent minorities in Bangladesh live in relative harmony with the 85 percent Sunni Muslim population. So, in, in a certain sense, uh, what we are trying to do is to ensure that there is uh, a certain uh, uh, legal status which is provided to those uh, you know, refugees who have fled uh, countries uh, in our neighborhood uh, from religious persecution uh, or for other means and, and us living in India today. Thank you. Uh, is the lady over there? <laughs> well, it's not a lady, it's a guy. <laughs> there. Yeah, yeah, there's a lady over there. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed your talk. It's always nice to listen about how much India's progress requires. Can you briefly introduce yourself? I'm Adi Mahajan. I'm a first year student here. Um, I'm actually, uh, my parents are from India and I have a PIO card. So I was wondering if there were any talks on like dual citizenship and if there was any words between that. Well, you must be holding what is called an OCI card now. And, yeah, and uh, the OCI card, uh, sorry, it's, it's some detail which, uh, which uh, uh, really applies to uh, Indian American community, uh, but Indian diaspora all over the world. Essentially, uh, India does not have dual citizenship because there are certain provisions in the constitution that uh, make it difficult for us to bring in dual citizenship. But the OCI card tends to substitute dual citizenship. In other words, it gives you every right that an Indian enjoys except right to vote. And, uh, and uh, which means that you can, if you are a professional, you can work in India, you can buy property, you can buy agricultural property, you can, uh, you can just about do anything that an Indian citizen can do except vote. Uh, and I, so I hope you use that uh, facility and... and uh, Thank you. The, the, the gentleman right at the back standing up. Hi, um, my name is Sakit and I'm from Kashmir. Everyone here has been talking about Kashmir and how things have been normalized. Uh, Mr. let me tell you that I haven't been able to talk to my family because like 99% of people in Kashmir, people don't have landlines. In this modern world, people don't have landlines. My family have suffered in the sense that there are problems in reaching to the hospital. We can call fire tenders to douse fires in Kashmir. Nothing, absolutely nothing is normal in Kashmir. So you said, I listened to your talk, you said that there were development issues in Kashmir before, but you, if you look at the development indices of Kashmir, it's much better than the other states of Kashmir, even the women rights. No one in Kashmir gets lynched unlike in India. So please, uh, let, please listen to the Kashmiris. What do you have to tell me? Because I am not able to talk to my family. My sister who is a doctor there, she has to email, she has to call me over a phone booth for research material because she needs research material for, for her patients. She's a doctor. She cannot download it there. I have to download those papers and then send it over to someone in, some, in Delhi and then when he flies to Kashmir, she, he can give him the research material. So what are we supposed to do now as common Kashmiris? What are we supposed to do? We can talk to our families. It has been a very bad situation. But thank you. So your question is, what is the situation like? So uh, let, me, let me say that uh, uh, a few congressmen who were approached by constituents like the gentleman here uh, saying that they couldn't reach their families had approached me. 
And I've told every congressman that if you have a single person who cannot reach his family, contact me, I'll make sure that you can reach your families. And that goes for you. I don't know which part of Kashmir you're from. But if you give me if you give me the contact number of your sister, I'll make sure that there is uh, contact with her and you can communicate with her. Um, out of all the congressmen, only one congressman came back to me, and uh, this is Congressman Tom Susie. And I put his constituent in touch with his relative he couldn't get in touch with. It is true that there are 93,000 landlines in Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I live in, uh, in a part of India that's quite remote also. I'm also from a hilly area in the, in the northeastern part of India. Uh, and uh, all areas don't have cell phone telephony, but there is some landline somewhere that you can use to contact it. So uh, if you have any problem, I can assure you that I put you in touch. Uh, I don't think there should be any uh, uh, doubt on that uh, score. I think as far as we are concerned, uh, we want to make sure that, uh, that uh, people of uh, our citizens in Jammu and Kashmir have a better future. Uh, in the last few decades, you've seen uh, a protracted sense of uh, conflict and uh, militancy, uh, increasing radicalization, which has been induced by, uh, by those who are across our borders. Uh, cross-border terrorism that has accounted for 42,000 lives uh, in our country. Uh, we want to introduce a new paradigm uh, and, and the abrogation of Article 370 and the bringing in of economic measures that would provide a huge amount of economic development in the state. Uh, 50,000 uh, jobs which would be filled in. Uh, the procurement of apples, which is, which is the peak season now, uh, $800 million being allocated for apples, which benefits 700,000 farmers. Um, I'm told that, I don't know how you feel hospitals don't work, but I'm told that 700,000 patients have visited outpatient departments of hospitals in the state. Uh, 49,000 surgeries have taken place. Um, I'm not disputing what you're saying. It's possible that, you know, in certain areas people have difficulty, so don't get me wrong. But in general, what I'm trying to say is that the situation today is far better because not a single life has been lost on account of uh, a bullet being fired by security forces in a state that has seen 42,000 lives lost to terrorism and uh, a situation where there is radicalism which has been induced uh, by forces from outside the state. So really for the citizens of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, what uh, we are looking at is a possibility of a future that is free of radicalism but also which cuts the ground from under the feet of uh, militancy and terrorism. Younger people of Jammu and Kashmir or the majority of the population need to have some opportunities, economic opportunities. Why are there no colleges and hospitals of some, uh, you know, quality in Jammu and Kashmir? Because there's no investment. Investment was actively discouraged as was entrepreneurship. Today, uh, you have groups that can invest in Jammu and Kashmir, you can create hospitals, create colleges, uh, bring in uh, the sort of uh, values that, uh, I mean, the sort of uh, commercial, uh, let's say, values that uh, people of Jammu and Kashmir can avail of. Why are so many people from the state having to go to other states to study? Uh, because you don't have investments in education. Uh, so what we are saying is that allow a free, uh, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, regime where investments can be made, uh, where you can have, uh, uh, you know, opportunities that give the younger people uh, a future, right? Uh, let's say optimism for the future. And again, uh, something that uh, will give uh, uh, you know, an opportunity for, uh, for us to come out of decades of, of uh, you know, a dead-end situation uh, in which uh, there's no hope for most of the people in the state. Yes, we have time for some more questions. This gentleman there, right in the middle. Good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Dan Kingstead. I'm in the marketing department here at UNC as a student. I'm also in the military. So the question I have for you is, what's the appropriate military role for India and Afghanistan at the time? Well, you know, uh, we have been uh, partners of the United States in, in both developing and stabilizing Afghanistan. We, we've uh, invested $3 billion in that state. Uh, we have uh, constructed the Afghan parliament. We have provided, uh, we've constructed the Salma Dam. Uh, we provided transmission lines. We've also had a port that links up to the western part of Afghanistan. Today we have uh, projects in each and every district of Afghanistan. Uh, we've also trained uh, the Afghan uh, national and uh, security forces. Um, and of course, uh, you know, we see uh, Afghanistan as a very important uh, country in our neighborhood. Uh, the peace and stability in our neighborhood really depends on, on uh, how Afghanistan shapes up. 
um, uh, you know, after 18 years of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, blood and resource uh, spent in Afghanistan, we do understand that the United States is seeking uh, an exit policy from that country. But we believe that uh, that particular withdrawal has to be a considered decision. It has to be a considered withdrawal. In other words, it has to be calibrated to ensure that the gains that you have achieved over 18 years of, uh, of uh, an involvement in Afghanistan should not be lost. The gains that you have made for minorities, uh, for the constitution, for women, for the security and defense forces, uh, those have to be retained. And uh, those uh, like yourselves in the military who have sacrificed and been there, uh, I think you would agree that, uh, that uh, what you have fought for and what you have uh, given so much for have, has to be retained. You cannot move out in a way that takes that country back to the pre-2001 era and again becomes a problem not just for the region uh, and countries like ourselves but also for the United States. So we need to work together and we are very happy to work with the US in that endeavor to ensuring that uh, as you withdraw, you withdraw in, in a manner that uh, leaves Afghanistan as a stable uh, and uh, you know, a continuing uh, sort of uh, state. Uh, Sovereign state. Thank you. Perhaps we have time for two more questions. Um, over there, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, my name is Yasmin. I'm a PhD student here at UNC. Um, I want to start off since you mentioned it just by clearing the record and saying that though thousands of people did show up to the Audi Modi event, there were also thousands of protesters that have not got the same media coverage, uh, more worried about the increasingly fascist tendencies of both Trump's America and Modi in India. And in regards to Kashmir, um, I just really specific question. When will basic resources such as internet be restored? Well, um, Howdy Modi was uh, not an event which was, uh, Howdy Modi as the title suggests was really uh, the Indian community's uh, event for Prime Minister Modi. It was for him to interface with the community. Uh, the president was uh, a guest at that event, but you also had uh, some 25 uh, senators and congressmen from all over the country who were present. Uh, you had um, uh, the uh, uh, majority leader Steny Hoyer who also spoke on that event. Uh, so you had three speakers. You had majority leader Steny Hoyer who spoke on behalf of the Democratic Party, where the president who spoke on the event, and you had the Prime Minister of India who spoke. And of course, uh, you know, I think 50,000 was only a notional figure, but uh, that was the capacity of the stadium. Uh, I think uh, there were at least another 20,000 people who couldn't come into the stadium because there was no, no, no further capacity. Uh, as far as protests were concerned, I was there uh, in, in uh, uh, Houston and I must say that I didn't see a single protester. I drove through Houston, I was part of the car cave, we went everywhere, we didn't see a single person there. Uh, and so I don't know what protesters you're talking about. Uh, um, if there were protesters in Houston, I can assure you I didn't see them. Uh, the authorities must have done a very good job in hiding them there, but uh, I certainly didn't see them. Uh, as far as the internet is concerned, uh, internet has been used by militants and terrorists. It's a well-known factor to uh, launch attacks, uh, to mobilize people, to mobilize proxies. Uh, we know that uh, certain areas that are inimical to us, including Pakistan, will use the internet uh, uh, in a manner that would create uh, the loss of lives. I've already conveyed that we have not lost a single life in Jammu and Kashmir since uh, the uh, abrogation article 370. We intend to keep it that way. As someone said, the right to tweet is not as important as the right to life. So if you think that internet should be introduced and people should do their lives, then that you can do it from the comfort of the seat that you're sitting in, you're not sitting in Jammu and Kashmir, and facing that uh, uh, level of, of violence and, and uh, terrorism that, is, uh, that can be introduced uh, through, uh, uh, induced through, uh, uh, proxies and through others that, uh, that Pakistan will promote. So what I'm trying to say is that we will introduce internet as soon as possible. Uh, the idea is to ensure that there are conditions are normal and that it should not lead to the loss of a single life. We should do it in a manner that is phased, that is calibrated and that takes into account uh, the uh, interests of the citizens uh, of India in the state of Jammu Kashmir. Mm -hmm. <coughs> One final question this gentleman there. Senior Public Policy Major, thanks for coming up to Tennessee. Um, my question is, could you talk a little bit about the quadrilateral security dialogue that India's role in it? Well, you know, there are two formats. One is what is called the Japan, America, India, in which uh, the Prime Minister and Presidents of these three countries meet uh, periodically. Uh, we've met twice in, in, uh, in uh, Buenos Aires and Osaka. 
And the other is, uh, as you mentioned, the port, which is uh, you know, uh, Japan, America, India, and Australia. Uh, the port met for the first time at the foreign minister's level uh, in New York. Uh, I was present at the meeting. And uh, I think, uh, as I said, these are countries that have uh, very similar views on how we want to see the Indo-Pacific in our own area develop. Uh, the idea is to exchange views, to exchange uh, uh, you know, ideas, to also synergize where we have our respective strengths and uh, try and see how we can work together. Uh, we are looking at areas that, are, uh, you know, that provide inclusivity. Um, you know, it could be HADR, it could be other areas like maritime pollution where we could cooperate and where we could uh, work uh, in places that are uh, extend right from the Pacific Island states uh, down to uh, the Gulf uh, region. So uh, right now these are initial concepts that I'm sure they will develop further, but they are important nonetheless in the sentiment that these countries have that we need to come together, we need to, uh, to uh, have as much of uh, you know, close uh, contact and exchanges as possible and that uh, we need to also collaborate wherever uh, necessary. Thank you. Before I let you go, can you enlighten us about the future and the improvement possibly of student and faculty exchanges between India and the United States and the cooperation of Indian and American universities? Because I think we all would like to benefit from the rise of India and travel to India, study in India and of course welcome Indian students back to the US. Uh, well, this is an area where well, the education sector is one that's, that's growing very quickly and I, and I mentioned that there are a very large number of Indian students who study here. But uh, in India, the education sector is changing very quickly. Uh, in the earlier days when, when I was in university, uh, you had uh, most of the better education institutions were public institutions that were state universities. Uh, today you have a very large number of private universities, private colleges, private institutions. So private funding is coming in a very big way in India. And as these uh, institutions develop, they look for partnerships uh, in order to uh, obviously provide quality. And these partnerships are always uh, you know, mutually reinforcing in many ways. So I think there's a huge amount of scope for uh, US and Indian uh, institutions to collaborate in areas that are range from research and development uh, to uh, areas uh, that involve exchange of students for semesters. I know that you have a summer in India program. Uh, that sort of program can be, I think, uh, taken forward in many other areas. Uh, you can, you can uh, uh, have extensive collaborations in practically every field uh, possible. And Indian universities and institutions are particularly interested in seeing how they can work with US universities in faculty exchanges, exchanges of uh, knowledge-based exchanges, uh, and uh, exchanges of students. Uh, so all of these exchanges are very valuable uh, to us in, in uh, developing our own uh, education sector. And I think uh, this is an area that is the knowledge-based sector and the education sector between India and the US that offers maximum potential in the years uh, to come. And I think uh, the scope is, 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 we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg today in, in that sort of collaboration. I think the scope is enormous uh, in, in the future. And we're very, very uh, happy that uh, leading universities like the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill have taken the lead in this regard and continue to do more and work uh, closely with your Indian counterparts in, in achieving greater cooperation in the education. And visa requirements will be eased uh, up. We have a very good visa regime because uh, the U.S. gives us 10-year visas and we give U.S. citizens 10-year visas in the normal course. Uh, there are different categories of visas, of course. I mean, there are employment visas, there are uh, you know, research visas, there are conference visas, and so on and so forth. But uh, in general, uh, ten-year visas are the norm. Uh, we don't have that for too many countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, but let's do away with visas. Just you know, use your passport. Well, uh, we've talked about free trade, and we should talk about a free visa regime. Yeah, exactly. I quite agree. Thank you very much for coming here and talking to us.